Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. But Gary, I don't wanna. I really don't care. <laughs> Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. (laughs) Correct. We're talking about adulting. (laughs) It's okay. So with the passage of time, (laughs) as uh, we've deemed ourselves cubs of a certain age, let's say, we've had to deal with some things that came along um, in our life path, you know, that we weren't exactly prepared for in our youth. Uh, some might call it ignorance was bliss, but, you know, in recent years, we've discussed the desire for, um, our aging population, so to speak, to relive their youth. Um, we've talked several times about the nostalgia factor of like marketing and commercialism. So there was just a couple of questions. Um, and this is a little bit of a teaser, uh, in a couple weeks when we do our, what's going on, I will explain how this significantly came about, um, as a topic this week. But before we get to that, uh, for today, you know, I have some questions like, has adulting been too stressful? Because, like, this wasn't even a term, I don't think, when we were younger. Like, we didn't say, like, you know, oh, I have to adult today, or adulting sucks, or I don't like adulting, or any of that. Like, I just don't remember it being a thing. Uh, well, I have an answer, but you have to play a clip if you have the sound cue. No, it's actually on Wiki. It's on. It's on. It's more adult website. It's it's Wikipedia. <laughs> well, you know, as opposed to you know, like stocky dudes as an adult website. <laughs> but you know, no, I mean, like, just we just asked the question. And I was like, what? What does that mean? Like, how did how did this come about? So, according to Wikipedia. Adulting is a neologism, new word, um, 
it's basically uh, any relatively recent or isolated term or word or phrase um, that has achieved popular recognition. That's what neologianism is, okay? So adulting. Correct. Well, language is fluid, like it's ever evolving. That's one of the things that we love about it. So adulting as a recent term um, is being recognized as as, rec as being defined as like uh, growing up, like another way of saying that you grew up um, and became popular on English speaking social media in the second half of the 2010s. So that means roughly between 2015 and 2020 is when this became a thing. And apparently American writer Kelly Williams Brown has been credited with coining the term. The term is commonly used to refer to the context of tasks and activities that are necessary to carry out in order to live and function within mainstream civilized society, but are typically only done by adults due to pragmatic, financial, physical, or legal restrictions rooted in age. So here are some examples. Paying your taxes, paying utility bills, shoveling the snow, if you have any. Uh, jury duty, paying your mortgage or rent, driving and commuting. Um, yeah. And the, the list could go on and on. <laughs> Yeah, like all the things that, that keep you alive, basically, or functioning. So the, the, well, uh, sure. I mean, I, I will say this as an only child who, has been pretty independent most of my adult life. I wasn't necessarily living alone, but I quickly surmised, ain't nobody else helping me. <laughs> like, either I do it or I don't. Like, that's kind of what it comes down to. So, um, to my question about has adulting been too stressful, I, oh, it has its moments. Well, I think part of the part of the the battle we find ourselves in with this concept of adulting is the emotional, uh, I guess, roller coaster that we go through. Because sometimes adulting is stressful; it's ang it's anxiety inducing, um, because you have to make time to do certain things, or you have to remember to do whatever the thing is. Um, and some of them are very life impacting and some of them uh, not so much. So, you know, and, and balancing the whole priority concept for ourselves as to like, I got to do this thing versus this thing. Some things are, are very kind of straightforward, like paying bills. If you want to have a roof over your head, best pay your rent or your mortgage. Best pay your utilities if you want to have electricity, if you want to have internet, if you want to have gas, if you have it or whatever. Like those things are pretty straightforward because if you don't pay for them then you don't have them and some other things you kind of like uh, like i can i can get by well uh to a, yeah 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 
No, and, and you're not wrong. I, I years ago moved away from that as much as possible because I got super pissed about like unexpected amounts in my bills happening. And then not knowing that, oh, I planned on that bill being $98.25 and suddenly it's $115.23. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, that's not in my budget. Um, and that's probably, you know, uh, me <laughs> being triggered <laughs> discussing that. But I think it's a carryover from my 20s where it's like I was literally living paycheck to paycheck. And so it's like, you know, I was watching all of that stuff. And, and not that that's, you know tremendously improved i would say it's gotten better but i'm also much more practical about having had a spreadsheet budget for i don't know 20 some years or whatever now like i just learned it's the best thing for me because it keeps me on track and it helps me feel confident in the tasks of paying for things and knowing what i can do but it also makes me pretty cheap on some stuff. Like I can't get over when people talk about that. They spend hundreds of dollars on groceries. And I'm like, why, why are, why are you doing that? I mean, to be fair, some people have families, so they have multiple, you know, individuals in the house. Um, and I do not. So I like my, my, my frame of reference is very different compared to others. Well, and, and and I think, you know, we are uh, we just gave an example a moment ago, right, about a very different, like, uh, practical kind of thing in, like, the pre-show and talking about grocery shopping that I don't really go in with a list. Like, I'm not, like, making to a recipe and pre-planning necessarily. I'm I'm looking for money saving, and I allow that to deem whatever it is that I'm going to do and what I'm going to make, which is a very different operating procedure, but it also leaves a lot of things up to fate, as to what I may or may not find, um, as opposed to just going in and, you know, with a. Mm -hmm. Right. No. Yeah, I mean, there's something to be said for that. I mean, I, it's amazing to me the price of things these days. Like when I look at stuff and I'm like, like, especially when I was buying stuff for the event years ago, like I intentionally was buying things on sale. So like I would go to the grocery store and I would be buying things for two to three months in advance. Non-perishable items like soda was a big thing. So I would be buying Nam brand soda, Pepsi, Coke you know, Diet Pepsi, Diet Coke, whatever, but I was buying it because it was on sale. I was getting it for like 99 cents a, a two liter, which is sort of unheard of now. And that's the wild thing to me is that things have gotten so damned expensive and I'm just like, ah. I'm like, you know, so as I've, as I've aged, as I've become more of an adult, I guess I've become like cheaper <laughs> about everything because I'm like, I'm turning into the, well, I remember when. Yeah, I mean, I think I feel like, well, and, and don't get me wrong, like, I come from a family. Right. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't necessarily look for those, but I also don't look at the ad. Like, I just don't pay attention to that much stuff because to me I don't have the time for that and I do come from a family of, of very frugal people who do that kind of stuff like back in the day I have a family member who would go dumpster diving for the Sunday papers because all the coupon like booklets would be in them and the local paper it's not made in town anymore unfortunately but the local paper some there were some strategic places where they would dump their leftover newsprint and so 
this family member would literally go diving and get those things. And then the family, like at the next get together, like they would literally pass around stacks, like huge stacks of coupons, like but not cut out just the whole ad and everything. And then everybody would just kind of look through them and talk about the good old days when they used to not have expiration dates and like the double couponing thing. And like, it was up to a dollar, but sometimes there'd be a sale and blah, blah, blah. Like I come from a family that was very much into that. And I learned from observing it and doing it for a little bit of time. And I was like, Oh, I don't have enough time in the world. Sorry. Not, not, not my gig. I still have, Vaseline skin lotion to this day that I bought too long ago because of that whole era. I was like, oh, but like it's on sale at CVS and like it was buy two, get one free. And then I there was a coupon where like you like got a, a 50 cents off a bottle and it was on sale. So I bought like, I don't know, like eight bottles or some ridiculousness for like cheap and did not think about the fact that this was going to probably life last me a lifetime because – I don't, I don't put that much lotion on my skin, you know. So, I yeah, I feel like there are times that adulting can be stressful, um, to the point of for some people, I think it's overwhelming to have because I think adulting is about responsibility. And responsibility means you have to take action. You are accountable to things because there are things that absolutely have to be done. Um, but it doesn't have to be. Um, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, that you. Well, I think that's a big piece of it, though, like whether or not you want to do the thing. And the reason I phrase it that way is because, you know, you said, I, I don't know if I feel that I want to do it or whatever. And I think that's part of the struggle of like being a quote unquote adult or a grown up is just doing what needs to be done. Like, you know, taking care of X, you know, whatever X is, fill in the blank, taking care of the oil change or your personal health, your mental health, your like, you know, whatever, whatever those items happen to be. And I think that's a little bit where it can be stressful, um, especially if we don't necessarily have the tools to think, to like consider ahead plan and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm all about people who like take it as it is, like as it comes and just like be free flowing about it. I've grown more into that over the years as my life has gone on. Like, for instance, went and visited friends recently, you know, for a long weekend getaway. Didn't really make any plans. 
because I used to be that person that was like, oh, we're going to do this thing and we're going to go here and blah, 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 blah. And I have found as I've gotten older, like I'm okay with just like chilling and hanging out or, um, and not necessarily being that committed to stuff. And I'm also okay with doing things and I don't need to, but I don't need to be that way all the time. So I, I understand when people are like, well, you know, I do, do it. I get around to it when I get to it. I'm just as guilty as anybody else. As much as I might have like a tendency to be anal retentive, I also, I'm like, my home is not immaculate. My life is not perfect by any means. Yeah, I mean, I'm not super excited about the state of my office, but I also <laughs> kind of don't care. It's weird. Anyways. <laughs> so um, another question was, is getting older not so enjoyable? And here's here's kind of where I was coming with this question is like, I just had a milestone birthday. So I, I think this is part of the reason I, this whole thing came about also was... Uh, if I was half my age, I was doing re some reflecting. Where was I? What was I doing? What was my life like? What did I know? What did I not know? Um, and I think that's what this is about is like, like being a teenager. I remember being like maybe even pre-puberty. Like I <laughs> – I I wanted <laughs> – I remember being so young and being like, I can't wait to be an adult. Like, I just wanted to be a grown up so bad because I felt life would be freer or would give me more opportunities. And that is all accurate. What we don't know in our youth, though, I think is there's a balancing act to that. Like, in order for your time to be your own, you do have to do some things so you have time to be your own. And, you know, a big piece of that is like having an income of some kind to pay for the things that you want to do and that you need. Um, and so I remember like in my 30s, I think it was, there was this whole period where we used to joke about like, this, uh, this growing up and being an adult shit was the dumbest idea I ever made. <laughs> Like, because when I was a kid, I was taken care of. I didn't have the responsibilities or the worries of the world on, on my shoulders. Well, and, and I think that's a key piece of it, right? Is like, you know, we, we have expectations. <laughs> well, I mean, we have expectations. Yeah, I think we have expectations of what, of what the future will be. Um, however, the future that we imagine is very slow and forthcoming. And it may not even happen in our lifetimes. And that becomes challenging and creates this, like, schism, I think. Like, this um, disconnect because we're expecting... You know, when we when I was a kid, I watched the Jetsons a lot. So I was like, wow, that that future is very interesting to me, you know, um, and graded it was a cartoon. I don't know. Right. Probably because the concept of the TV show was meant to be a parody of what we think the future is going to be, but none of us caught that as kids, probably. <laughs> so that's where it went sideways because we were all like, I can't wait until I grow up and I have two kids and a and a spouse and a robot that like does things for me. Um, yeah, I mean, like, that's what I mean is like, you know, we we think that certain things are going to happen and and I don't. And I also don't think when I was younger that I imagined a lot of what, like, being older was going to be like. I was just too busy doing things. And I'm still kind of doing that to this day. Like, I was talking 
with somebody recently at work on Friday. Like it got announced that there was a bunch of people getting together after work and they wanted me to go. And I was like, sorry, can't. And they were like, oh, and I was like, got my other job. They're like, okay. I mean, and it's really ironic because some of these people are younger than me, but I'm the one who's dedicated and wants to, you know, be able to have the things that I have. So I have a second job. And I think that it's ironic to me to be the age that I am and still feel like I'm living at least a good decade to two decades behind myself <laughs> because I because my life hasn't changed that much. Like I'm still doing certain things certain ways like that hasn't really shifted, I guess. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think you bring up some interesting points about, like, you know, the paths not taken and what that would be like um, if things had turned out differently. You know, your your comment about, like, would you have even done the podcast? Would it exist? And what would that mean? Um, and how things would be different? Absolutely. Like, when I got diagnosed in 2010 with cancer, like, that wasn't – that was not something I expected to happen, at least definitely not at that point in my life. I thought it was, you know, going to be – years decades down the road before i might have to deal with something like that and it you know it, it so it shifts your trajectory um being fired from a job or let go uh whether you're fired or they decide to downsize whatever um you know and you have to then kind of scramble reassess and reorient um and I think those are things that we don't really talk about, at least our generation didn't talk about with younger, with our, with the kids. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't know. I could be wrong. I come from a very specific upbringing and it had, did have some privilege in it in various ways that I know that others didn't have. Um, I mean, we weren't well to do or anything, but being white it, in and of itself was a privilege. Um, you know, and I had two parents that worked. One one was full time, one was odd jobs kind of stuff. And and so I didn't have for want a whole lot. I had a roof over my head, always had meals, we had transportation, like um, we took vacations, 
I traveled as a kid with my parents and did things. So like, I just kind of didn't really think much about that, but also uh, generationally, I don't think the kids, we, we as children were sat down or even as teenagers and be like, listen, there's going to be some shit that's going to happen and you ain't going to be ready for it. So buckle up buttercup, (laughs) you know, like, I mean, my, my dad was very mature in talking to me, you know, when I was, I think I was just becoming a teen and my parents have divorced. I think, and my dad had made a comment about, listen, when you came into the world, nobody handed your mother and I a book about how to raise a child. So doing the best we can here. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because he talked to me very adult, like even though I was an adult, but I was also precocious as a kid. Because I was an only child and I was around adults all the time. And I didn't really have any kids like around my age that I hung out with or friends. So I just acclimated into an older mindset and behavior. That is to say, I think I kind of found myself transitioning into adulthood easier. Uh, But still, they didn't kind of sit down and talk to me about stuff per se. Um, And I think that that's... I don't know if it's, I want to say it's intentional. I just don't think it's a a fabric of our society that we prepare that way. I mean, how many times have we belly ached about how like nobody prepared us for like the concepts of adulting and how to handle money and to pay bills and, you know, that kind of stuff. Right. <laughs> well it's fair Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I remember my mother and I, when I was a teenager living at home and my mother just sat me down and had a frank, very frank conversation with me because I hardly ever did homework and she was mad about that. And she's like, you don't really apply yourself. And I was like, what? She's like, you don't push yourself like you don't try to be better and I was like okay why and then my mother told me she was like your father and I struggled in school we were not gifted we we did not naturally get things and if we didn't work hard at our homework we didn't get like B's we would normally get a C or a D 
you don't apply yourself. You don't really do anything. And you naturally get B's and A's. And you just take it for granted. And I'll never forget that conversation because my mother was really upset with me. She's like, you don't push yourself. You're really good at math. You could probably be a math teacher one day or do a lot of stuff with like science and math. She's like, but you just don't realize that you have a gift because you don't know any different. And because you're not – because you are our child, you don't know what our upbringing was like. You don't know the struggles that we had, like how hard we worked to be able to – you know." To, to go to school and have passing grades and be able to graduate. And she went on to nursing school and I'll never forget that because I, I didn't, I didn't get it. And then I remember we had a conversation about like, I got an offering to go into like an AP English class, I think, or something. And, you know, they were telling me that it would be better for my, my school, you know, transcript or whatever, when I go off to college <laughs> and this goes to show how much of a problem I was as a teen because I remember back then I was like, wait, so you want me to take an accelerated course? Like I can get it naturally get an A or a B right now, but if I take an accelerated course, I'll probably end up with like a C or if I'm doing, you know, if I'm really, you know, working on it, I could probably get a B, maybe not an A. So my GPA is going to go down because I took a harder course class please explain to me why i want to do that <laughs> and they're like well it looks better and i was like does it because the gpa suffers <laughs> no i know but <laughs> i get that but that's that was my thinking, and, and I picked that up for my father because he has always been through pretty much his whole adult life like a challenging personality to like look at a circumstance and then find a flaw in a theory, in a process, in a policy, in a whatever, and then point it out. And like that's why I'm laughing now looking back on it all these years, and I was like, God damn, I was such an ass. Like I was just like, why should I work harder? I don't need to. And I didn't. Still got into college. <laughs> mm <laughs> because they want proof. Right, right. Right. No, and, and I understand that. I loved math and science until I was a part of the way into college. I love math all the way until Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.
Mhm. Mhm. That's... Yeah, I mean, I think that's fair. When I, I mean, like I was saying, when I went to college, like, I loved math and science until a certain point in college because uh, I took a class of statistics because I had to have another math course or whatever. And, and this was one of the ones that would apply towards my degree. And I hated that class. Like, and I just couldn't wrap my brain around it and nearly flunked out of it. And I was so pissed about that. And then I had to take organic chemistry three times and because I had to have a passing grade in it. And I got like D's, I think the first two times. And I had to have at least a minimum of a C, I think, in order to to be able to have it count towards my degree. And I was so mad about that. And it really kind of turned me off in a way. And it's not that I dislike them today, but it was just this weird thing that like I just I reached a point where it wasn't clicking for me. Um and to your point, I didn't uh, completely switch modes from doing nothing or very little to buckling down and doing everything. And I think that was part of the issue was is that I didn't make the priority of doing the work to be ready for the thing, so to speak. Um yeah, interesting. Hmm. I mean, I think that's fair, you know. Um,
Okay. Well, it, and, and, you know, we've changed a lot as a society over the decades. I mean, when we were kids, I, I have no recollection of anyone talking about autism or Asperger's or any of these like things or talking about where a person is on the spectrum, um, them being high functioning uh, you know, that, that, you know, that there's a lot of different things. I mean, I've had some friends of mine that have, uh, I guess one way to phrase it is they've come out about their, um, situations and their, their personalities and things they've discovered about themselves. And I found that really interesting that they kind of piece together for themselves, either through going through therapy or, looking things up online, reading and learning some more, and then, you know, going and um, seeing a specialist and having some testing done to, you know, see if their gut is right. Like, is there something here? And finding that out and not knowing that and how it really improved their, I guess, general well-being because they're like, I have an answer to something that I didn't know before. And, you know, I think there's been a little bit of a struggle, at least in American society, as to whether or not this is a trend, like, because we see more and more persons being identified in certain ways. And 
just like this is sort of not the same thing. It's a it's a parallel about how more and more individuals are identifying themselves as trans or non-binary, you know, fill in the blank. And I feel like, well, when you find out that there are other options and there are things to describe then you don't feel that you have that you're trying to force yourself into this thing. Like I remember, I don't, we've kind of talked about this on the podcast in the past and you know how we struggled with our identities in terms of like our attraction and what that means and how you, you know, are portrayed in the world and how you behave and what's acceptable. And when you find out like, Oh, this is a thing and it's okay. You know, it really kind of shifts your existence. And I think that is also a piece of, of adulting is like uh, finding your authenticity, determining like who you are as an individual and what that means. Um, and I think that's one of the things that can be, kind of a shining moment is in our adulting quote unquote, or our growing and evolving and becoming more and more fully ourselves is, is that whole like, Oh, this is a piece of who I am. And it, sometimes it takes effort and you have to kind of work at it with some consistency to realize, um, you know, that I, I can do this, but it takes effort. And, you know, I think about that with work at, at my current job, my main job, I've been coined like the wordsmith. I'm really good at writing. I know how to like communicate things in a written fashion really well. Well, that wasn't always necessarily the case. I mean, yes, when I was younger, I was told that I was a good writer and I thought someday I'd write a book and I'd be a famous author. But like that's there's innate skill, but then there there's also like experience. And it cultures you. And my previous career in private sector working in, in a corporate environment where I had to write things for people to read and understand and to utilize as a resource um, taught me a lot. And working in a professional environment, I learned how to write an email that is professional and not just like, you know, slang or <laughs> whatever you want to call it. So I, I think that what people don't realize is that, you know, we're constantly learning and evolving as we grow. Um, and it sometimes it's an awakening and you discover like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing for me. Um, but once you when that once that kind of happens, then I think we adjust accordingly. And sometimes it takes a while you know, to figure out, um, I'm a stress eater. I respond and, you know, and, and pivot in this way. I am quick to anger about this. I, you know, uh, close myself off from the world and I just like want to curl up in a ball, um, and avoid things like, you know, we all have different behavioral manifestations about responses to whatever the things are that are happening in our lives. Um, and I think as you experience things and you go through stuff, you determine what works for you. And the reason I'm saying all of that stuff just now is because we didn't have language for that. And, and in fact, I was just discussing this recently with somebody and I can't remember who it was. We were talking about how different the world was. I think it was at work. We were talking about like how, like the generations through the fifties, sixties into the seventies, it was very much like this was the expectation. And when you went to public education, like there was a right way and a wrong way. And that was the end of the story. And I feel that society at large learned to conform to meet a standard because that's what was deemed was acceptable. And we as a society evolved, changed, grew pushed back, like asked questions. And now we've moved into a very different place where there are standards, but we accept that individuals have different skills. 
they have different abilities they have you know um i remember like how it, like i just saw a video yesterday of this person on youtube and they were writing a list and the camera's over their shoulder and they're watching them write and they were writing left-handed and my first thought was oh i didn't know they were left-handed because we still to this day don't really um i think and maybe it's different, you know, for younger generations than it was our generation. Like writing left-handed wasn't a thing. Like, and it was very few and far between. And you weren't celebrated. If anything, you were kind of made to feel other because you wrote left-handed. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm not saying that, like, you know, that they cracked down and prevented people from doing that, but they, there was a norm, like, you, like. Right. And, and that's, and I'm not saying, like, that was the case in our generation, but, like, I think there was definitively, like, a, a baseline. And this was the expectation, like, you will do this, this is how this works, and that's the end of the story. Um, and if you don't, then you fail. And I think that we've shifted away from that and in, in recognizing that, like, you know, people have different skills and different abilities. And like you were talking about, like, with the math situation that they want you to show the work to prove that you actually know how to do it. And I don't know how much that's still a thing to this day because we've adapted so much technology into our lives that we allow that to be a thing that, like, gives us what we need. So I don't know if, like they still go through that regimented of a process, you know, say with math, especially higher math, that you have to show that proof as opposed to the technology was able to determine that. I don't know. I, I think... Um, I'm pretty sure that that stuff's happening in like kindergarten or first grade. Like years earlier than like kind of when we did it. Like I remember how big a deal it was to learn the multiplication tables in elementary school. And like to be able to do that because that was like a marker of achievement and to be good at math and that kind of thing. And I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. I really don't. That's how I like. You know, I don't know that stuff. Oh, I don't know if I ran again into that. <laughs> right, right. Right. So. Um, the last couple of things, like, I was kind of wondering, like, are there any shining moments that we recall for being an adult and on our own? I mean, I know for me, there are a couple, like, buying my first car that was, like, a big deal because, like, I did that. Um, getting a job, like, you put in the effort, you applied, you know, you put a resume together, you interviewed, that kind of stuff um getting getting my own place for the first time i was fully well in adulthood before i lived on my own other people might do it sooner but i mean i right out of high school i went into college i spent five years at university and when i wasn't at university i was home especially in the summers and i was working um graduated still stayed at home for a couple of years and then eventually like moved in with friends who moved to the South, did that for a winter, got a seasonal job, like kind of ping ponged around a little bit, but I always had roommates. I had like something going on along those lines until I moved here where I'm currently living, which is where I've been since I came to the podcast. This was like the first place that I ever like found on my, like searched, found, went through the whole process, achieved, like, unlocked that badge so to speak and like have my own space what 
What's that? Yeah, but I'm. Right. But, but that's a thing that like, no one taught me that no one, no one oriented me on that or instructed me on how to do that. Like, um, and that's what I mean is like, you know, I, I saw it as an achievement in adulthood. It's like, I did that thing. Like I used my intuition, my intelligence, my skills and abilities to get that thing, um, to have my own space, to acquire this stuff, whatever. Um, and the reason I guess I say that is because I think we take it for granted. Um, a bunch of us, I think, really feel that we just figure it out. And that's fair <laughs> to a point. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I, I think. I think that's happened to a lot of folks um, that we've shifted. I mean, I think the pandemic escalated that or like enhanced that, accelerated it, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it was a big factor. But I think that was naturally happening for people because it's like, oh, I don't have to do that. Well, then I'm not. <laughs> like you just and I think it's also a part of adulting. Like you, you make you get to make decisions for yourself. Do you want to go out and do something? No. Well, then you don't have to do it. Um, and I, and I think that we were raised, like, again, this concept I was bringing up about, like, there were times or, I don't know, like, it was just an expectation that you would do certain things. Like, you would, this is what the family does, or this is what you do as neighbors, or whatever. And I'm not saying that, that that's good or bad. It's just a, a reflection, you know, that, like, that's changed. And I think generationally... Ours plus the generations behind us have been slowly shifting from, well, I don't need to do that, or I don't have to do that. And there is a distinction between, like, doing the things that are kind of necessary. And by necessary, I mean, like, the topic things we already covered, like paying bills and being responsible along those lines, handling your finances, that type of stuff, taking care of your well-being. Like, those are... Those are kind of just base life skill uh, necessity things as opposed to, oh, there's a birthday party I was invited to. In the past, I think we, it was like, well, you were invited. You're expected to go. And I think that shifted to, hmm, do I? I don't think I have to. I don't feel like it. So I'm not going to go. Um, and that's a thing, you know, that's occurred. That's why I mentioning about the, the event with work that a bunch of people were going out to drink and then I got invited and I was like, yeah, I can't, I have to, I have to go to my second job. It's interesting because I realized that especially with this job that I've had for a couple of years now that I haven't done a whole lot socially with my coworkers at my previous job, 
longer term, I had done quite a bit of that, but there was a pocket of us that had kind of came tightly together and, you know, ended up becoming friends because of that. And and some of us are still friends to this day. So it is a shift. It's different. Like, you know, someone made a comment about how they were surprised that I did go out once a month or so ago. Um, and as it had turned out, I had requested off my part-time job in the evening and the thing that I was going to do fell through and it was too short a notice for me to ask to still work. I mean, I probably could have, but I was like, oh, screw it. I've already got the day off. And then I remembered at the last second, like, oh, that's right. I was invited to this thing and I said I couldn't go, but now I can. So I, you know, reached out and I was like, hey, I'm actually able to make it. And they're like, great. We'd love to have you show up. So it's a social function. I go out and it was a very interesting like, experience to go out and be with a bunch of coworkers in a social environment that didn't have to do with work. And like I caught myself being like, oh, is this what people do? Because <laughs> like I don't do that. Yeah, I mean, we've also determined – we've done a lot of, like, self-assessing as we – I think as we've grown up and we've become adults and we determine, like, how much do I have energy for? How many spoons do I have? Like, what is – where are my limits? And if you work in a highly interactive environment, then you might not have much left to give. And you might be like, you know what? I I need to not be – <laughs> I need to not do. I need to not be around people. I need to not do things with people. I need to not interact. I mean, when I worked from home here for a number of years in the previous career and then like eventually came to this job and like, well, the one right before it actually uh, for less than a year and like led to this one, like I had to go back out into the public. Like I had to go work with people and I was super anxious about that and very like stressed in the beginning because I quickly realized, like, I'm not a fan. <laughs> like, I, not that human beings are horrible, but eh, they're also not winners. Like, you know, I was just not feeling that. And it was kind of comical. Mm -hmm. Right. 
I mean, I think that's fair to know your limitations and be like, this is just is not in my capacity or it doesn't interest me. I, I think about that, like my best friend and I, we've joked about this. We have been management. We have been supervisors. And we both moved away from that because we just kind of, I don't know if I want to say we burned out, but we didn't exactly have great experience. <laughs> and so we're like, hmm. Can I do it? Yes. Do I enjoy doing it? No. <laughs> like, so that that last part kind of weighs on you. You know, there's been some discussion at work about like, you know, why why have I not been interested in moving into a, you know, another level? And I'm like, well, first of all, there aren't any positions that I can move into. I don't qualify them for them at the moment. And second of all, like, I'm okay with what I'm doing. Like, I enjoy what I'm doing. And that's all right. There's nothing wrong with that. Um. Well, and, and and there's nothing wrong with that, Jeff. And that's one of the things, like. Well, I mean, I think you bring up an excellent point, though, because I, I I dealt with that in corporate culture. There was this expectation that you would move up the chain and you would, you know, ascend the ladder or whatever. And I kind of pursued that for a little while. But I agree with you. Like, there are stalwart people who are like, um, I don't know what I want to call them. Like, I wish I knew what the proper term was, because I think we used to give them like names, but like as a label. But I feel like there are people who are just like the like reliable steadfast people that come in they show up they do their work and they go home and they don't have interest in really moving or shifting or like rising up through the ranks or whatever like that's not they're content with what they do they're good at what they do they're reliable with what they do and there's nothing wrong with that and Well, I, th I, I because I think there's a, a biased expectation or viewpoint or whatever that like that's a disservice unto yourself for not wanting to be more or to do more. And I'm like, no, like there's something to be said for not, you know, being stressed all the time or anxious or bothered or whatever. You know, I mean, one of my very good friends who's like family totally burned out because they did ascend. They actually took on a job that like we had talked about when we were younger in our careers that like, that's kind of where you want to go. And then like that position, like it's three or four positions up and then that leads to an even bigger position. Like you really get to be a change agent, like all this stuff, but it's not all it's cracked up to be. And especially if you're not very well supported and you know, you're, you're really, not necessarily in the best of like life spaces, head spaces. Like there's a lot of stuff with that. And I think that's another piece of adulting, you know, is that you, you are in a place in a time that things are acceptable and doable, achievable, whatever that may be. And it takes experience to determine the who, what, where, when. And so I find it ironic that a couple of years ago, how I didn't have a job for quite a while. And now I have, so now years later, here I am, two jobs, and I serve on, in an executive capacity with like three different things, all volunteer in some fashion. I put time and effort into them. 
Like, I have a full schedule. And I'm okay with that. So, you know, as, as someone was saying to me, like, well, have you thought about you know, like pursuing, you know, a, a higher level? And I was like, well, first of all, if I did, I'd have to give up something. Like, and I, and hopefully I would give up the second job, but then I started doing the math and I was like, you know, if I went for this one position, which is technically two levels above me, the salary difference in the take home is not that much more than what I make now with my second job, which I don't mind doing. So why would I want to do that? <laughs> Like, this goes back to my earlier analogy about the whole, like, uh, AP class thing. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah, it's understandable. I mean, I, I think. No, I mean, I think. It, I I think it's all adulting, like life, life is a series of tangents. It's a different, bunch of different paths. And that's a big piece of it is like, you know, we were just talking about, you know, change, thriving on change. Some people do and other people like stability. And I think those are the lessons that come about, like growing up and discovering that. 
and you can't necessarily know those things. I think what we're not doing very well as a society is talking about this stuff for younger generations to know, like, hey, there's this stuff. And, you know, we can't give you specific examples, but shit will happen. Things will come along the way. You will do things for the very first time. And you have the ability to do it on your own. Um, and I also think we don't have a lot. I don't think we do a very good job of like letting folks know, like, hey, I'm available if you have questions. I I know I have done that intentionally to people that I've sort of mentored in a way or pseudo parented um, that I wanted them to be aware. Like, if you have a question about something, I'd be happy to like see how I can provide you with some insight or some input or what I can do to help. Um, but that's me because that was one of the innate things I learned about me, especially being a corporate trainer, is that like when I was in elementary school, they asked you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I panicked because I didn't have any ideas. And then I realized I like all my teachers. So I, I said, I want to be a teacher, which everyone thought was probably me kissing ass. And then I you know, got into high school and I realized that I love marching band and I wanted to be a marching band director. So I went off to college to be a music teacher. Ta-da. And then I almost flunked out. So <laughs> turned around and shifted course, went in a whole different career direction, but like it took a long time to get there, but my path eventually winded me into being a corporate trainer, an instructor and a developer, a facilitator. Like it gave me a whole career. It was, it was good. I'm, I'm so blessed that I had it. And now I work in public health, which is wild to me because I've always kind of had a through line of some things in my life that have like kept me it kind of going in a certain direction. And here I am all these years later. And I just didn't know that was a thing. So I'm now in another decade of my life doing something that I probably could have done from the get go right out of college if I'd had known or thought about it or pursued it. But it just wasn't there. But I also don't live with regret and be upset or bothered by it. Like I had all these things that came along the way. And that's I think what a big piece of adulting is, is like is knowing that. It, it will come when it comes. It will be OK. You just hopefully have some preparation along the way. And if you don't, that's okay too. You'll figure it out. And uh, don't, you know, don't forget to, to communicate with people and ask for help. Awkward silence. Um, yeah, so nobody heard anything I said during this entire thing. What are you talking about? Well, Din Din just said, you're muted, Jeff. And it have been since the start. Sorry to say, I just joined in. <laughs> so, Gary, <laughs> there's no show this week. Okay, are you are you being recorded now? Yeah. All I'm right. Not, I, I'm not. I don't have the spoons to do the show over again. That's good. <laughs> That's good. We discussed that earlier. So here's what everyone's going to learn from this. Jeff and I just had a whole hour of a podcast, the two of us talking. We talked about a great many things, and nobody's going to really know that because we learned a lesson. You should double check your settings. Make sure everything's working correctly. Because sometimes things like this will happen. So instead of not having an episode this week, prepare to, to put an episode together. Had a great conversation. You're only going to get about 10 minutes. <laughs> it's going to be the shortest well, episode. In no, existence. no, no, no. Here's the thing is. Here's the thing is. <laughs> we're going to get the Gary show uh, oh, with no. guest star oh. Jeff. So we'll just post it anyways. With the... the he, he totally fucked up. Gary talks about adulting. Yeah, that sounds great. That's what everybody. That's what everybody wants. They just want to listen to me on a one-sided conversation. Should, should we call this like like C O L seven eighteen A? Uh, I mean, I don't. Uh, I don't know. Should we just wrap up the show? Yes, I guess. <laughs> Doing normal wrap up. Well, Gary now knows a whole bu a bunch of stuff about me that everybody else could have known, but <clears throat> Jeff made a boo boo. 
and didn't make sure that his audio settings were correct. Well, that's fun. Anyways, where were we? We were, we were ending the show. So if you enjoyed this monologuing with a few, <laughs> few, few quiet moments, <laughs> You can contact us in many ways, such as comment in your blog at CubsOutLoud.com, choose an email at CubsOutLoud at gmail.com, leave us a voicemail saying, hey, you suck at checking your your audio settings at 361 talk. that's 361-265-8255. Come on you know Twitter. what they could also do, Jeff? Yeah. They could call us and leave us a message, but not actually record anything. Yeah. There you go. That would be just fair. Stay silent during the whole time. That, that's fair. <laughs> or just mute themselves. That'd be great. So the mic doesn't pick anything up, you know. For for our next what's going on show. <laughs> you can comment on Facebook. Just put some ellipses in the middle or something. Twitter and YouTube, I cut to a lot in the appropriate place of your house. Uh YouTube, like, comment, and subscribe and say say, hey, make sure your audio settings are correct. Uh, join us on Telegram at bit.ly slash telegram dash col for our, ch our ch entourage chat. Find out when we're planning and recording these shows at bit.ly slash calendar dash col and subscribe to our Google Calendar. You can also get various accoutrements such as a flexibility for accessibility shirt designed by Smashy. You can find more of his work at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. And or Zazzle story is Zazzle.com slash comes out loud where you can get that merch. I've been totally thrown off now. Become a patron at patreon.com slash comes out loud. Uh, uh, or send us a donation at paypal.me slash comes out loud. Please rate us and review us on your various podcasting platforms such as Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. You can find me on the internet sometimes as box set box, poppy box, crap box, something or other. If you want to get in touch with me, if you if for some reason you've made it to the end of the show and you want to reach out, um, there's several ways to get in touch with me. Uh, obviously through the podcast, but you can also just like find me pretty much anywhere online as Gear Bear Seven Three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs>